All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the um, the August edition of the Java User Group, and um, it's our usual uh, introduction. So we're just gonna you know go around the room and get everybody to say hi and introduce yourself and tell us what you do with Java, and you can use that information later on in the night for networking when we're over in the pub side and. You, uh, you're looking for people with similar interests. All right, this is our usual housekeeping slide. We have a meetup group, which is probably the best way to find us. So if you just search for Toronto Java User Group on meetup.com, you'll, you'll find us. If you, if you join there, it sends reminders about meetings. And we, that's kind of our, our first place to post information now. It's, uh, it's pretty successful. We still have the mailing list. We still have the Google Plus community, but they're a bit less active. Um, we record all these meetings and post them up. Um, they're available off our site there, and they're available on meetup.com. If you go into the pages section, they're all listed there. And we also have a, a job postings mailing list, so those people who are hiring. Um, the, the list is called Toronto Java Jobs on, on Google, so definitely check that out and post to it. It's moderated, so you won't get any spam from it. I, I personally like What's approve things. What's the statistic there? It's about one in a hundred? One in a hundred, something like that, yeah. So it's, it's, very, it's very low um, low messages, but there's quite a few people subscribed. There's like three, 300 or something like that. So if you want to get a message out, it's, it's not it's a bad not way. It's a place to go if you want to be an Oracle <laughs> consultant in Atlanta. Yeah, no, it's the wrong message board for Those that. Jobs <laughs> they don't make it um, O'Reilly has a discount code for our jug, it's uh, PCBW. If you put that on their website, then you get a good discount. So that's uh, nice of them to do that. And Java news for this month. Um, the uh, Java is currently the number one popular programming language. So it's been back and forth between Java and C for the last year or so, but it's, uh, it's currently Java and it's picking up steam and the journalist community seems to think that's because of Java 8 and people really liking the new features and things like that. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, there's been a bit of a debate in the community about um, Oracle's proposal to remove the Sun, MISC, Unsafe um, APIs from the JDK. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of tech community writers who think this is the end of Java and everything's going to completely explode and everybody's going to pull support out and this is an absolutely critical thing that everybody's using in their applications probably. No. Um, yeah, so uh, apparently it's used in a few big memory libraries and things like that to find out stuff about the system that you're not really supposed to be able to learn from Java in, in a pure kind of uh, standpoint. But just wondering if anybody here has ever ever used any of the APIs in there for anything? Or you have? Yeah, for uh, off heap data structures. Right. Yeah, that's because uh, so you, you can allocate system memory outside of. Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're not impacted by any garbage collection. But NIO can also do that in a supportive way. And then your app goes up to JDK. Is it as performant? There is a small penalty, but it's. So all these, like, a lot of the uh, off heap stuff, it's intrinsic. So it has no performance impact compared to like you, know, you can increment a piece of memory as if it were long as quickly as you can do you know long plus plus. Right. No, there's a small penalty for using the NIO memory mapping, but it's not bad. And I think some of the synchronization stuff they have as well. But like being able to access an element in an array using volatile semantics rather than treating the array, the reference to the array as volatile, what you can't do in the language, but you can do in the same state. Although I haven't actually Yeah, it sounds like um, in the last JEP that they posted, they're going to leave it in Java 9. Um, and they're going to try to figure out better ways to deal with it. And hopefully, they want to remove it eventually, but they're going to wait, because they realize that people do actually use it, even if it's rare. 
Uh, new minor Java release came out, uh, update 60, which has got a couple bug fixes, uh, usual couple security patches. Um, they turned off the RC4 cipher by default, uh, which is good because it's, it's broken. Um, and their key store loader automatically detects key store types now, which is kind of a minor change, but interesting. Uh, this one sort of attacked me at work the other day, so I thought I would rant about it. It's, it's kind of a, a little personal Java thing. I use the Oracle RPM packages for Java to install on production systems, and they re renamed the package. And it, it used to be called JDK, and now it's got the version number in the package name. <laughs> the face palm. It's, uh, yeah, I, I really don't understand why, but they, they say it's a management decision and it probably won't be fixed. So uh, that was. <laughs> not just the version number, but all the way down to the pack. Yes. <laughs> yep, that, that's the current package name. It's uh, JDK180 underscore 60. And the version number is 180 underscore 60 as well. <laughs> it has a new pack in it as well, right? Yeah, it's like 2,000 colon. Yeah, it's, it, anyway, it's not, I don't know yeah, why. I, I, um, some excitement from JRuby. They put out a major new release, calling it uh, JRuby 9000. And uh, it's apparently got a lot of rewriting in it. I don't know. If Is that how long it takes to execute? <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's faster. They've, um, they've made a whole new compiler. Uh, it's got a lot more threading support. It's got a lot more... Uh, JDK JVM features. Uh, it's got better I/O. This is this is what they say, and they're trying to keep it in sync with Ruby, the real version. So things are more likely to run just straight across on JRuby. So it's pretty cool. And that's the news I found this month. I don't know if any anyone else in the room have like exciting releases of software or anything else you want to mention. There's a, there's a Java One early bird discount that's good until the end of August. Oh, that's right, yeah. So you should go to Java One, and if you're planning to do that, you should register before August 30th to save like $600 or something. And DevOx is rapidly selling out. Yes, also go to DevOx. Yeah, so that's... As a side note, here in Toronto, they're running a Scala conference, uh, Scala North. Yeah. Scala, Scala North. Scala okay. North. The name. Ooh, yeah, it looks like it might be interesting. When is it happening? September, September 20, 25th and 26th, I think. Because it conflicts with strange ginormous car. I'll add that the server expert group is looking at some form of reactive streams implementation for server 4. It's at the shall we, shall we stage at the minute, but that's got some interesting potential. Nice. Excellent. All right, so now we'll have uh, Mark with our presentation. Okay, then. Um, as I said earlier, my, my name's Mark Thomas. I'm an Apache Tomcat committer, and I'm here tonight to talk about Apache Tomcat 9 and give you an overview of the sorts of things that uh, are going to be coming in the next major release of Tomcat. So a little bit of information about myself. I've been a committer since December 2003. If you do follow the Tomcat mailing lists, then it's markt at apache.org. That's what you'll see all of my commits, all of my comments under. Currently, I'm the Tomcat 8 release manager. That means I try and do a release every month or so. Um, we're at the stage now with Tomcat where we try and f make sure that every, well, we do pretty much make sure that every bug is fixed, that every open bug is fixed before we do the next release. So I'll start the release process on the beginning of the month, and you can pretty much guarantee as soon as I announce it, then three bugs turn up in Bugzilla that need fixing before I can actually do the release. Um, so the releases happen roughly around the middle of the month, usually. And then if the bug count is lower that month, it's a little bit earlier. If some of them are a bit harder to fix, it's a little bit later. Uh, Violetta is the release manager for Tomcat 7. She also does releases about every month, and again, we're fixing all the open bugs there as well. So the only exception to that are those ones where we 
think there's a Tomcat problem, but we're not sure, and the people reporting the bug can't provide us a test case that reproduces it. Those tend to just sit in the bug tracker as need more information for a little while until we can actually figure out what's going on. And they do get fixed eventually. They, sometimes they take months, sometimes they take a little bit longer, but they do get fixed once we can eventually figure out what the problem is. Um, I am a member of the Servlet, WebSocket and Expression Language Expert Groups. Uh, it's the expert groups that help Oracle write the specifications that feed into Java EE, so I input into all of those because Tomcat obviously implements them. My day job is a consultant software engineer, or at least that's what my job title is this week, it seems to change on a monthly basis, um, at Pivotal. But really, my, my direction from Pivotal is very, very simple. Go and do whatever you think is best for Tomcat. Oh, and tell us what you've been doing. And that, that's pretty much it. They don't tell me what features to implement, they don't tell me what bugs to fix, uh, they don't tell me what my priorities should be, apart from whatever's best for, you think is best for Tomcat, crack on and do it. Um, that probably takes up about 90% of my time. The other 10% of my time is split on TC Server, which is Pivotal's app server that's built on top of Tomcat. Um, my main responsibility there is as Tomcat does new releases, feeding those into the TC Server release process, so TC Server is always kept up to date with Tomcat releases. I also do third line support for Tomcat and TC Server, so if, if customers have a sticky problem then chances are it's going to land up on my desk pretty quickly. Um, and finally, I'm the lead for Pivotal's security vulnerability handling team. So if there's a vulnerability in a Pivotal product or service, Hopefully it gets reported to us first, and then we do the coordination between the reporter and the product team to make sure that the vulnerability is handled. Um, that sort of came about because I'm also on the Tomcat security team and the Apache-wide security team as well. My main focus is on Apache Tomcat 9, which I would say I'm probably spending about 50% of my time working on, so doing, essentially implementing the new features um, and doing the cleanup that was required to do some of that. And really it's that work that I'm going to be focused on this evening. As I'm going through, if you've got any particular questions, anything you'd like more detail on, anything that isn't clear, do grab my attention, ask the question, I'm happy to take questions as we go through. Equally, if you want to wait till the end, that's fine too. Um, I'm probably going to be in the bar with a lot of you for a little while afterwards. If you want to catch me then, happy to, happy to do that as well. Um, if not kept under control, I could probably stand up here for three or four hours talking about Tomcat, possibly longer. So um, I, will, I will aim to keep it a little bit shorter. What have I got about an hour left-ish? Give or take? Yeah. It's probably two then. Um, <laughs> So yeah, and, and it, so if you do have any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about anything Tom, even Tomcat or even just Apache related. So do feel free to just grab my attention. So the way I roughly want to structure this is first talk about what the new specifications are going to mean for Tomcat, then go on to talk about the things that are outside the specification that Tomcat's doing. Then unusually, Tomcat 9, we're actually taking a few features out. Um, we don't tend to do that on the scale that we're doing it in 9, so I'm going to men mention those in, in a particular section. And then finally, I'm going to just talk about some of the internal changes we've made that won't directly impact you, but you should see sort of indirect benefits in terms of better well, even better stability, even better performance. So I'll just sort of explain what those are as well. Before I sort of go into the individual specifications and what they mean, I wanted to sort of do a little bit of background. So, a major Tomcat version is driven by a release of Java EE. So, there will not be a Tomcat, I won't even start thinking about Tomcat 10 until we start talking about Java EE 9. Tomcat 9 is Java EE 8, Tomcat 8 is Java EE 7. Yes, we have an off by one error, no, we don't think we're going to fix it. Um, so if I could just persuade Oracle just to jump a number, that would be great, but d don't think I'm going to have much luck with that. Um, so if we, were to, if we were to do sort of a major internal refactoring in Tomcat, which typically in a typical software project would mean, oh yeah, that's going to be a major new release, we won't increment the major version number. What we'll do is increment the second one. So we did that in Tomcat 5. We, there was a big internal cleanup and re-architecting, and that created Tomcat 5.5. 5. 
Um, there's been some discussion there might be something like that with Tomcat 8, but it's only at sort of the discussion level yet, and if there is, it, there'll be a Tomcat 8.1. But um, we really haven't got any further than just discussing about it. So Tomcat version, major version is maps to Java E version. And what people are perhaps less aware of is that Java E versions have minimum Java versions associated with them. So what that means is for Tomcat 8, Java E7, it has a minimum Java version of 7. So what that means is it must run on 7, and when you test it for compatibility, you must test it on Java 7. It also means you don't have to run on Java 6 if you don't want to. Um, and typically we don't. We just we say, yeah, a minimum version, Java 7, that's great. That's, that minimum version is going to create some interesting problems for Tomcat 9, which I will come on to when we start talking about some of the requirements. So Java EE is the sort of the broad overall spec, and then un obviously underneath Java EE you've got however many, 20, 30, I lose count of individual specifications. At the minute Tomcat is interested in four, and it's about to be interested in a, in a fifth. And th those are the ones that the vast majority of applications depend on. So servlets, JSPs, expression language, now that was split out from JSPs, you can't do JSPs without expression language and then also WebSocket, which became wildly popular pretty much as soon as it was announced. Um, WebSocket was actually introduced in, in Java EE7. We've made, made it available on Tomcat 7 as well because there was user demand for it. It's not actually required to support it, but we've, we just backported it and, uh, and made it available. Also, we support Java, uh, sorry, WebSocket 1.1. The difference between 1.0 and 1.1, there was a method that um, could be a little bit ambiguous at times to do with generics. So they introduced a more specific method and that was basically the only change between 1.0 and 1.1, but we just did the update. So in terms of what Tomcat 9 is going to do, well, servlets are definitely going to be servlet 4. I'm guessing it's going to be JSP 2.4, I'm guessing it's going to be EL 3.1, and I'm guessing it's going to be WebSocket 2.0. Those are all guesses because basically no work has started on them yet. And I'll go into a little more detail about what I think is going to happen in those um, when I look at them, them on a per specification basis. JazzPick is something that we're intending to add in support for in Tomcat 9, and again, I've got a slide that covers that. Those last two columns are the dates that to that Tomcat version first had a stable release. So it's not its first release. Normally we have some alpha releases. Um, well, typically we wait until the Java E spec is final. Then after that we have alpha releases, then we'll have beta releases. And once we're happy, based on the feedback we get from the user community, particularly the, the number of bug reports and the severity of those reports, that that major Tomcat release is stable and we're confident that it can be used in production, that's when we call it stable and we have the first stable release. Um, the end of life dates, um, those are always announced at least a year in advance. Um, and we always try and keep three versions, well, we always say we'll keep three versions of Tomcat supported at any one time. So at the minute, we're supporting six, seven, and eight. Um, the rough plan is eight will get new features, bug fixes, security fixes, seven will get bug fixes and security fixes, and six will just get security fixes. That's kind of the minimum. What, act, what tends to happen is, well, eight gets everything, seven gets some of the new features and all the bug fixes and all the security fixes. Six gets the odd new feature, doesn't happen very often, but, but most of the bug fixes and all of the security fixes. So we actually do think we do a pretty good job of backporting those fixes all the way down th through the lines. If you look at the dates, because the major versions are driven by the Java EE specs, which are always a number of years apart, and we have three Tomcat versions supported at any one time, what that means is we tend to support Tomcat versions for quite a long time. And we've got, what, eight years there, almost 10 years. But that's not atypical, and I can see seven and eight being supported for similar sorts of time frames. So if you, do, if you are running on a particular release of Tomcat, then you've got a, the reassurance that, yeah, it's not going to be, sort of, the rug's not going to be pulled out from under you next week. Um, it's going to be a, supported for a considerable period of time, and when we do get to the point when we de-support it, then you know, we will announce it well in advance. And the de-support notice for Tomcat 6 went out, uh, I think I sent it out about a month, a month and a half ago, and that was almost 18 months notice that support was going to end. And really, that wasn't really a surprise to anybody because we'd already started on 9, so you, you, you could effectively see that coming. I mean, Tomcat 
seven, yeah, we're not going to look to de-support that until yeah, we've made reasonable progress on Java E9. So that's, yeah, that's years away, yeah, two or three at least, I should think, before we start thinking about de-supporting that. So it sort of gives you an idea of what drives the major Tomcat versions and sort of the, the support approach that we take for them. The other bit of background information, uh, because a lot of the new features are all around the low-level I.O., I just wanted to cover this bit of information just to give you a little bit of context for what I'll be talking about. Tomcat's low-level I.O. is implemented by compo a component we call the connector, and there are four different implementations of that connector using four different um, I.O. technologies. The first one is BIO, the blocking I.O. connector. That's been around since the days of Tomcat 4. It's actually heavily based on what was in Tomcat 3, but it really first came into existence in Tomcat 4. And it's, as its name suggests, it uses blocking I.O. And for SSL, it uses Java Secure Sockets extensions. Next, we had the APR native connector. That was introduced in Tomcat 5.5. That's non-blocking. Um, it uses the APR, which is the Apache Portable Runtime, so the same I.O. library that HTTPD uses, and it uses OpenSSL for its um, TLS support. So to use that one, you need to have a separate native library installed inside alongside Tomcat and tell Tomcat where to find it. In Tomcat 6, we introduced NIO. No, no prizes for guessing that's based on the Java NIO libraries. It's non-blocking, but again, because it's pure Java, it's using GSSE for the, for the TLS. And in Tomcat 8, we introduced NIO2. Again, no pri surprises for guessing it. That's the Java NIO2 libraries it's based on. Again, pure Java, so it uses GSSE for TLS. What's worth noting is TLS performance in GSSE is shockingly, shockingly bad. It's atrociously poor and we're talking orders of magnitude performance difference between it and OpenSSL. So if you are using Tomcat to terminate TLS in production, you really, unless you've got incredibly low load, then you really need to be looking at using the APR native connector to, to do that. Um, but with that background, some of the other things I'll talk about will make a little bit more sense in Tomcat 9. Quick question. Yes. The, um, what's the performance comparison outside of NIO? between APR and, and like the, sorry, outside of SSL, between APR and NIO, fairly similar? Um, so you can construct a, um, sorry, for the benefit of the recording, the question is, what's the performance difference outside of TLS for those four connectors? And you can construct a um, benchmark to demonstrate that any of them is better than the others. It's pretty much give or take, no difference. Um, the non-blocking ones will always scale better, obviously, um, but in terms of raw performance, not that much to draw between them. So, specification changes. So if you look at the initial announcement for Java E8, there were sort of five key things that it drew out as the, the, what were going to be the key themes for Java E8. So the first one was HTML5. Well, that's in the yet yeah, whatever category as far as Tomcat's concerned. HTML is a static file. It doesn't care about it, whatever, whether it's HTML4, 5, 6, 7, whatever, it just passes it straight through. So that's really not going to impla impact on Tomcat at all. Next one, a little bit different. HTTP2 is a big change. Um, how many people here are familiar with the major differences in HTTP2 compared to 1.1? Few, few, few people saying yes, a few people saying not sure, a few people shaking their heads. So I'll, I'll just cover them briefly. I would say there are three broad differences. So if you look at the way HTTP 1.1 works, then you have one connection, and that one connection can process one request at any one time. Even if you shovel three or four requests down that, that TCP connection at once, the server will take the first request off the connection, process it, generate the response, write the response out, then go back and read the next one. Process it, generate the response, write it out, then go back and read the next one. So, it, so it's basically processing them one at a time. So it's one connection, one concurrent request response. HTTP 2 says, yeah, that's lovely, but there, there are obvious performance issues with that. I mean, browsers, you know, your typical web page isn't just one resource, it's several. And to get the fastest response to the users, browsers end up generating 
requests in parallel across multiple connections so, they, so the server will process the responses in parallel and get the data back to the user faster. Problem with that is that connections aren't the most expensive thing in the world, but they're not the cheapest either. And particularly when you scale up to tens of thousands or more of connections, then things like the size of the TCP buffers begin to chew up fairly large chunks of memory and you start to have scalability issues. So what HTTP2 has done, first of all, is said, right, one connection will allow you to multiplex requests. Um, the spec says, in theory, there is no limit to the number of requests that you can send in parallel. It suggests, a pr well, that there are limits in that the limit, e each request gets a stream ID, so the limit is going to be, what, about 2 to the 30 um, before you run out of IDs. So that's a, f a reasonable number. In what it actually suggests is a practical limit of at, at least 200 in terms of concurrent requests. Um, I'd be, I don't think browsers are actually going to go anywhere near that limit, but that's what the, the specification suggests. So what that means, you have one connection and the browser can send all the requests it likes to the server at the same time and then the server will, will generate the responses and send them back and hopefully it will distribute those requests to different processing threads so they'll all get handled in parallel and you'll get a much more responsive um, web website. What we've seen from people that have, used, that have sort of said, wow, when's Tomcat going to support HTTP2? I've turned it on from on my static site and my performance went up by, you know, and pick a percentage, it's 10, 20, 30, 40% improvement just by turning on HTTP2. So there's a definite performance improvement just from being able to multiplex those requests. So that's the first difference. The second one is something called server push. And the idea here is if I'm a server and I get a request from a client for, say, my home page, I know exactly what the client's going to request next. It's going to be the CSS, it's going to be the JavaScript, it's going to be the embedded images. So even though I know that's the, that the client needs that information, I have to sit there and wait for the client to get the response, process it, parse it, think, oh yeah, I need these extra resources, and then send the request for those extra resources before I can start sending them to the client. So there's an, there's an inherent delay there. What server push lets you do is say, look, I know you're going to need these, I'm going to start sending, to, sending them to you now, so the server can start sending them out earlier, which again gives you better response on the client side. Now, there has been some debate over whether that's actually going to be more efficient. And the reason there's been some debate is the clients, clients have caches. And these resources are generally static, and clients tend to cache static resources. So it might be the case that if I decide to do a server push, I'm actually pushing resource that the client's already got, in which case that's actually not more efficient, that's less efficient. So, because the client's going to say, yeah, no, I've already got that, I don't want it, and cancel the request. So the HTTP2 spec doesn't, doesn't really have any views on wh what you should push and what you don't. Um, the servlet spec also doesn't have any views on what you push and what you don't. It provides you an API for doing it, and it's then up to either your application or the framework your application is using to work out what makes sense to push in that particular case. And the assumption is that you will have more information about your application than what makes sense to do server push and what doesn't. Uh, the final thing about HTTP2 is by default it, it's intended to run over TLS. Um, and it places a couple of requirements in terms of TLS features that it requires. And those are server name indication, which lets you do virtual hosting under TLS, and it's ALPN, Application Layer Protocol Negotiation, and that's essentially the bit that lets the client and the server decide, yeah, no, we're going to use HTTP2 for this rather than HTTP 1.1. And I'll discuss that a little bit more later. Um, next, back to Java 8, next key element, simplification. Mm, lovely idea. Um, my issue with this is that Java EE never deletes anything. So when they simplify things, all they actually do is they add a second API for doing the same thing, or something that's a bit like the same thing. And you often end up with applications using the old one and the new one at the same time, and what you end up with is more of a mess than you had before. So I'm never convinced that simplification actually works. I'd be delighted if we actually deleted some of the stuff we've deprecated. Um, 
Uh, when I started on Tomcat back in 2003, there was stuff in the s then was deprecated in the server spec. It's still there. The expert group will, s well, the lead will still not let me delete it. Um, yeah, Oracle are absolutely dead set on we must always have the best possible backwards compatibility we can possibly have. So even if we deprec deprecated something years ago and everybody knows they shouldn't be using it, we still won't delete it. Um, and it, it's got even crazier in the WebSocket spec. Um, that change between 1.0 and 1.1, where there was this method that had ambiguous behavior, you know, clearly that needed to be deprecated to tell people to use the new one. Oracle were even anti, and in fact point blank refused to put deprecation markers against that method to tell people not to use it. I, it wouldn't even have broken backwards compatibility and they wouldn't do it. Um, and the argument said, well, if we deprecate it, we might have to remove it in the future. We don't want to do that. Well, yeah, it's not like you've removed anything from the servlet spec in the last 10 years. It's <laughs> That's one of those times where I sort of begin to tear my hair out. Um, and it, it's perhaps a good or bad, depending on your point of view, sort of insight into how the expert groups work, in that the experts Yes, they're from a broad range of companies across industry. They're, they're pro generally the right people. So on the servlet group, you've got people from Red Hat who work on JBoss. You've got people from Jetty. You've got Greg Wilkins there who, who works on Jetty. You've got me from Tomcat. Um, you've got people from Resin. You've got people that work on Glassfish. You know, you've got the right sort of group of experts, the people that should know what they're talking about. The problem is that it's only ever advisory. If Oracle wants something in the spec, even if every single member of the expert group says, no, that's a really, really bad idea, if Oracle wants it in, it goes in. If every single member of the expert group says, it'd be a really good idea if we did this, and Oracle don't want it in, it doesn't go in. So that all of the control is very much with Oracle. And sometimes that works pretty well, and sometimes you end up with um, a bit of a mess. And we'll sort of get an idea, another example of that in a bit. So that's simplification, and mm, yeah, nice idea, but I'm not convinced it'll actually help. Um, next one, better integration for managed beans. Yeah, managed beans, nothing to do with Tomcat. Move along, nothing to see here, not our problem. Um, and finally, better infrastructure for the cloud. Whatever on earth that means. Um, what it meant in the last spec was the, some sort of an ideas around multi-tenancy. And sort of the example I use for this is, if you imagine a company like Salesforce, they effectively have one application that they make available to lots and lots of different companies. So you could imagine a scenario, if you had a Salesforce web app, you'd deploy that to your Tomcat instance, and then you might want to customize it a bit for Pivotal, customize it a bit for this company, customize it a bit for that company. And the idea that this sort of multi-tenancy implementation was that you'd each version of the app would, would be a little overlay which would have the customer specific stuff in it and if you wanted to upgrade the app you just upgrade the core app and all of the customers would get the updated version instantly um, now that meant that there was going to be a lot of changes required in Tomcat's handling of static resources which at the time was an absolute mess we had about five different ways of doing exactly the same thing uh, it was all over the place it was incredibly fragile you only had a look at the code and you'd inter introduce a regression. Um, and the idea of trying to do overlays with it was really, really difficult. So with knowing that this was planned for Servlet 3.1, I spent about three months ripping out all of the old ways of doing it, implementing a new set of resource implementations for Tomcat 8. And pretty much the day I got it working and it was finished was the day Oracle announced they weren't putting that feature in the Servlet 3.1 spec anymore and I didn't need to do the work. It, yeah, I, I was a little bit frustrated, but on the plus side, it, to us, the code was a mess before, and it needed fixing. The refactoring was a good thing to do, um, so to get that done was, was worth doing. I mean, it does mean what, if better infrastructure of the cloud means something like that for Tomcat 9, then implementing it, it's going to be sort of in the 10, 20 lines of code order of magnitude. It's not going to be difficult, because it's now really, you can actually do overlays that kind of concept with Tomcat, with the features that are there already. 
So you, you can do things like, um, well, my core resources are in my web application, but when you're searching for anything, whether it be a jar file or a static resource, look in this location first, and if you find it, use it. If you don't, go and look in the, in the web app itself. If you still don't find it, you can go and look in this, this sort of post location over here. So you can do all sorts of interesting tricks. Um, there, we had a problem with the ASF's Jira instance, where um, the jars that Atlassian packaged with Jira, um, if you, um, basically they had multiple instances of the same package, same classes in different jars. And some of those jars were signed and sealed, and some of them weren't. So depending on which order the jars were loaded in, you'd get a package sealing exception or not. Um, and Atlassian had worked on the assumption that, oh, yeah, it, it'll just load them alphabetically. It'll be fine. Well, yeah, it did at one point, but there's nothing in the server spec that says anything about the orders that jars are loading in. And why on earth am I going to waste time sorting a list of 200 jars when I'm trying to load my web application as fast as I possibly can? OK, I'm only shaving a, a few milliseconds off the load time, but hey, it, it's, it's unnecessary code. We'll get rid of it. And Jira fell over. Um, so we were able to use this concept of pre-resources to tell Jira, yeah, when you're looking for jars, look for this one first. So it always loaded the right one in the right order and the problem went away. So you can do all sorts of tricks with Tomcat's resources implementation to make sure that particular resources take priority over other ones. You can load, you can insert jars, you can insert static resources, you can do all sorts of fun stuff. So that's there and that, that's working, ready to go. So that, that's sort of the broad, broad overview. So servlet four, um, very much in the, in, in the theme of work happens in the expert groups when Oracle wants it to happen or more accurately, when Oracle give their employees who are the spec leads time to actually work on the expert group stuff. So work started, it stalled, and now it's started up again. Um, if I was being cynical, I might think it was starting up again because Java 1 is just around the corner and they need something to announce. But I have to be really cynical to think that. <laughs> um, so main focus is HTTP 2, as we've talked about. Um, that's come out of the work that Google did on Speedy, and Speedy version 4 is very, very close to HTTP 2. A few years ago, Tomcat actually had a Speedy 2 implementation. Um, the code was hanging around in Tomcat 8 for a while, but basically the world has moved on past that. Nobody was supporting it. So we left it there long enough to steal any ideas that we thought were good for the HTTP 2 implementation, and then we just deleted the code. We did take a few ideas from it. And as I'm stood here talking to you, Tomcat does have basic HTTP2 support, and it works both over clear text, H2C, and over the encrypted uh, H2 protocol. I wouldn't, however, consider it stable. Um, it's not that difficult, just you, you know, start up Tomcat, enable HTTP2, go browsing around the examples web application. Normally takes me about two or three minutes before I manage to crash something. So it's getting there. It's still very much a work in progress. It's definitely not something I'd be prepared to use in production at this point. Um, the clear text implementation is available with all of the connectors. Um, H2, however, uh, is only available, so that's the encrypted one, only works with the APR native connector because we need one of the TLS features, ALPN, that at the moment is only available in APR native Java, Java, Java SSE hasn't implemented that yet. And that is that the fact that Java S JSSE doesn't support ALPN at the moment, that's causing us real problems, which I will delve into in a little bit more detail later. So basic HTTP requests work. If you try doing an async request, you get a blank page and a whole pile of things in the log, which basically say to do, must implement this. Uh, that's the next thing on my list. Followed by that, I'll do the server 3.1 non-blocking. Once that's been done, hopefully we'll be at a point where we have a reasonably well-defined API for server push, so then that will get implemented, and that's kind of the order I'm planning on doing things for HTTP2, and that's sort of, depending on how that goes, that could be anything from my next two weeks' work to my next two months' work. Well, it's very much a wait and see on that one. So, yeah, the problem we have with ALPN, so... The JSSE APIs don't support ALPN. Okay, that's not a problem, you think. Go, was that a question? Yes. 
ALPN is. Okay, so ALPN is the Application Layer Protocol Negotiation. What it is, is it's an extension to the initial TLS handshake that goes on between the client and the server. So what happens is the client creates a connection and says, server, if you support it, I'd like to talk one of these protocols, please. And it will list H2, standing for HTTP2 as the protocol it wants to talk. The server will look at that message and either say, H2, you're having a laugh, go away, not talking that, fall back to HTTP 1.1, please. Or it'll say, yep, yeah, that's fine, I understand H2, happy to communicate that way. And then as soon as the TLS handshake is completed, both the client and the server are both able to go immediately into H2. They don't need to do any HTTP upgrade, anything else. If you're doing this in clear text, you have to do an HTTP upgrade in order to get yourself from HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2. With the, by using ALPN, you can get dive straight into um, HTTP 2, and it, it saves you a couple of round trips. So you remember, hopefully, from my one of my earlier slides, that Tomcat 9 is implementing Java EE 8. That has a minimum Java version of Java 8, so it must run on Java 8. OK, so Tomcat 9 must run on Java 8. Tomcat 9 must implement Servlet 4. Servlet 4 must provide HTTP 2. HTTP 2 requires ALPN. ALPN is not available in Java 8. Ah, logic error. OK, that's, that's OK. Oracle run the servlet spec. Oracle control the Java specs. That's a simple internal request from the servlet spec lead to people working on Java. Please, can you add ALPN support in some form? Now, you know, we understand that. You might not want to change existing API, so whether it's a drop-in module or some, but please, can we have in any form that's usable, ALPN support in Java 8? Send request, wait a bit, no. Uh, okay, let, let, let's, we'll explain this again. This is causing us real problems, and so we go through the logic. Da, 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 da. Oracle, please reconsider. Okay, we'll reconsider. No. Great. So um, we have a problem. Um, now we have a similar. We actually have a similar problem with SNI. So SNI is server name indication, and that's used to do virtual hosting with um, SSL. So if we ignore wildcard certificates for a minute, because they, they just they they make this slightly more complicated. Let's imagine I'm going to on my server stand up a server that's going to serve the websites for tomcat.apache.org, tommy.apache.org, apr.basically everything.apache.org, and I want this to run over TLS. So when my client connects, the TLS handshake doesn't know which virtual host I want to talk to. The virtual host information in HTTP only happens once you send, can send the first HTTP message. But the server needs to send back the right certificate so the browser doesn't go, whoa, I didn't ask for http.apache.org, I asked for Tomcat. Browser server certificate doesn't match. Security error, drop the connection. So in order to sort of get around that chicken and egg problem, what you do is use server name indication. And in that case, the client adds the server name it wants to connect to to the initial TLS handshake. The server's then able to read the handshake, say, oh, you want tomcat.apache.org. Right, that's this SSL certificate over here. Here's your certificate, and the handshake proceeds. The client gets what it's expecting to see, and everything works beautifully. So the SNI bit is basically the bit where the server looks at the handshake, sees what host the, the, the user wants, and gives them the appropriate certificate. Now, allegedly, Java 8 supports SNI on the server side. And I say allegedly. Um, what it actually supports is still just one certificate. So already you can see we've got a problem. And the SNI support essentially consists of, well, we'll tell you what host the client said they wanted, and then you can decide whether or not to reject the TLS handshake at that point, depending on whether or not the one certificate we'll let you have matches. <coughs> yeah, that really helps. Thank you very much. So you think, oh, this can't be right. Yeah, I'm missing something here. Yeah. Th th that, that's not server-side SNI support, that's a joke. So you, 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 you spend a little bit of time doing some Googling, reading through the GSSE documentation, until you get to the bit that says, and this is written you know, in the Oracle's documentation, if you want to do server-side virtual hosting, 
what we recommend you do is pass the TLS handshake yourself, extract the SNI information, select the certificate you want to send back, and then direct the connection to the right GSSE context that's configured with that particular certificate. So at that point, I do a double take. I think, what, really? OK, and that, that's what we've, we've ended up having to do. And the reason you can get away with that is that the SNI message only goes from client to server, and it's unencrypted. So as on the server side, I can just parse it without knowing any other information, and I can extract the information I need. And then on the server side, I've basically set up a separate set of SSL configuration for each of the virtual hosts I want to configure. And then when the connection comes in, I redirect that connection to that particular set of SSL configuration. And then GSSC happily carries on and does its own handshake. No, oh, look, the server certificate matches. Gee, there's a surprise. And it, it all works. My concern is that the ALPN API that's going to be in Java 9 is going to have a similar flaw. Um, last time I checked, there were some discussions that were going around, going around between um, the people implementing it and the people that understood HTTP2 about what you actually needed to be able to do in order to do the handshake properly. Um, and because H H2 puts limitations on which TLS ciphers it finds acceptable, actually doing that initial handshake becomes a combination of looking at um, what ciphers the client supports, what client ciphers the server supports, what protocols the client has requested, what protocols the server supports, and then finding the best match across all of it. And there were some discussions about making sure all of that information was available at the right point so the server could control what was actually going to happen. Um, and certainly the first pass at an API to do that wasn't good enough. So I'm concerned that the, the result might not be good enough either. And the real problem is we can't use this parsing the handshake trick because ALPN has to go both ways. Because the, ser the client says what it wants to do, and the server has to say, OK, I've looked at what you've requested. This is what, I've, what I'm going to let you do. And we can't inject stuff back into the message that goes back to the client, because that would break the cryptographic signature on that, on that message. And the client would just go, whoa, no. So there's a man in the middle attack going on, which is exactly what would be going on. I'm not going to accept that, and it, the connection would drop. So we could have real problems with ALPN. We might not, we might get it right, but even, th even then we're still going to have a, it will only work with Java 9, and we have to work on Java 8. So what are we going to do? Um, when I talk about the stuff we've done on TLS, we have got some options for that that might work around it, and I'll come on to what they are. Briefly run through the other specifications. Uh, WebSocket, nothing's happened. Um, my guess is it's going to be 2.0. The reason I say 2.0 rather than 1.2 is the only thing I can sort of see from our previous WebSocket discussions about what might be the next big piece of work in the spec is the idea of being able to take an extension and have a, an extension implementation that you can move from container to container. The WebSocket 1.1 spec has the API for the client and the server to negotiate which extensions they want to use but has no API for you to be able to plug in an extension implementation. So what I'm expecting is WebSocket 2 will extend the API so you can write your own custom extensions and then plug them in on the client and the server, have them negotiated and have them used. But at the moment, that's nothing more than guesswork on my part. As I say, the expert group hasn't started up, so who knows what's actually going to happen. EL 3.1 also, nothing's happened. This one, I can't actually see anything obvious that needs doing. Um, arguably, maybe some Java 8 Lambda alignment. And the Lambdas that are in EL3, they were finalized before Java 8 was finalized. They were aligned as best we could at the time. But um, there might be some benefit in going back and seeing if there's some up tweaks we can make to better align them. But of course, keep in mind the we must remain backwards compatible. So we certainly can't change anything. We might just have to add some alternative syntaxes or something. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. That's really what I think is going to happen. And in terms of what users are asking for, if I look at the bug tracker for unified expression language, what all, pretty much all of them are saying, yeah, there's a bug in Glassfish's implementation of EL here. Please, will you fix it? So all of the user requests are all around fixing problems in the existing implementation rather than asking for new features. So I don't see much in terms of user demand for new features. Now, it may be that somebody will come along with some bright new idea. Oh, wouldn't it be great if expression language could do whatever, 
and then that gets into the spec, that gets implemented. But I have at no idea whether that is going to happen and no idea of what that wonderful feature might be. So really, I'm just expecting minor changes, clarifications, a bit of tidying up. For in terms of the JSP spec, there is no JSP expert group. Um, JSP is pretty much treated as being complete. Um, it's very much in maintenance mode. So what I'm imagining is just another maintenance release. And really, the maintenance releases in, in the JSPs are clarifying um, edge cases that have cropped up primarily because the expression language that JSP depends on is continuing to evolve. So for example, EL 3.0 added the ability to do s static imports of classes and packages into the EL, so you could then refer to static constants and the like in your expression language. Um, JSPs have absolutely no mention of this at all. So that raises the question, if I import a class into a JSP, does that make the constants available in, it, in the expression language? I think the answer is yes, it should, because otherwise the only other way you can get import stuff in EL to use it in a JSP page, th there are some really, truly awful hacks you can implement that will let you do it. Um, in a spec compliant way, no nonetheless, but they are pretty ugly hacks. Um, so I think the answer is yes, but it would be nice if the JSP spec actually clarified that and said yes, that the imports in the JSP page should be exposed to expression language, or no. I'm, 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 I'd be happy with a definitive answer one way or the other. I know what I think it should be, but you know, definitive, definitive answer would be good, then that way all the implementations will behave the same way, because at the minute, they don't. So that's what I'm expecting for JSPs. So really where we are in the, f in the specification that Tomcat supports at the minute, all of the focus, all of the new stuff is really in servlet and it's all around HTTP2. As I mentioned during the introduction, there was a brief talk about um, can we do something with reactive streams in servlet 4? Um, the jury's still out on that. Um, I've seen various proposals about how reactive streams might map into the, the servlet HTTP, HTTP model, and I'm not really convinced about any of them. Um, I'm not sure they're, they're actually that good a match, but I'm not that familiar with reactive streams, so that's more my, just my gut instinct based on what I've seen so far. I could be completely off base, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, a New specification for Tomcat 9 is JASPIC, so the Java Authentication Service Provider Interface for Containers. And essentially that's pluggable authentication modules. And there hasn't been much demand for it, um, the odd question here or there, but really where I see the benefits of it is there are authentication modules that implement things like OAuth with JASPIC providers, that if Tomcat implemented JASPIC, you could just drop these into Tomcat and you'd get instantly get OAuth support. So that sort of thing is potentially quite useful. Um, so I thought, I know, we'll use a Google Summer of Code product to have a look at it, because I've got no idea how much work this was. I didn't know whether it was a 10-minute refactoring job or a two-year implementation job. No, so that Google Summer of Code, let, let a student figure it out. Um, unfortunately, um, the student was not the most attentive during the first half begged and begged and promised faithfully they were going to be better in the second half, so I passed them. They took the money at the midterm and they ran. Um, so unsurprisingly, they got failed this week when we got to the final mark. Um, so on the plus side, they did get far enough that it's obvious that it's at the few weeks of refactoring to implement this. It's not actually that big a job. And to be honest, it's a small enough job that they should have actually finished it by the midterms if they'd actually been doing the work they were meant to be doing. Um, so my plan is I will, t I will basically finish that off for Tomcat 9 so we've got that implementation available. Um, other specifications in the Java EE framework, we occasionally get asked about the web profile. Um, my answer continues to be nobody that uses Tomcat is really asking for it. Um, people that write lightweight applications are quite happy with servlet, JSP, EL, WebSocket. Um, you know, when WebSocket came out, yet yeah, there's a huge demand for that, but we don't get any demand for any of the other things that are in the web profile. And to be honest, these days if people do want it, well, they'll go and use Tommy. Now, what it is worth noting, noting if you think back to that original slide, Tomcat has, oh, oops, today, is it? 
Tomcat has had a Java E7 compliant implementation of the specs it implements available for about 18 months now. Tommy, and to be honest, all of the main Java application servers are still working towards Java E7 compliance. Um, there's uh, Glassfish as the reference implementation. Um, you can, I believe, buy, buy support for that if you go to a third party, but you can't get it from Oracle. Um, JBoss have got an open source implementation, but again, they won't support, they won't provide support for it. Um, Tommy hasn't got there yet. And you know, they're still working on and Web Zero Web Logic. No, they're not available either yet for Java E7. Um, and that's Java E7. That's the last spec. Yeah, we're, we're, we're here talking about Java E8. So there is a delay in the latest versions of the, the broader Java E specification being available, um, which I think is another argument for the smaller, lightweight container. Focus on the specs that, like Tomcat, focus on the specs that people are, people want to use. Um, and get that development, you know, get those new features a little bit earlier. So, yeah, web profile, not going to happen. One that might, and this is very much in the, well, if we're doing JazzPick, and that's pluggable authentication modules, then we should at least look at Jack, which is effectively the, the, author the authorization side of it. So it's plug pluggable authorization modules. And I have no idea whether it makes any sense at all to implement it. I haven't even read the spec. It's very much in the, when I get a spare 10 minutes, I'll sit down and look at the spec. And if it looks sensible, I'll take it a bit further. I'll see what other providers are out there. It might be the case that there's some, there's some useful features there. That it might not. But we're looking at Jaspic. We may as well look at Jack at the same time. So that's the, um, so the, the sort of specification new stuff. In terms of Tomcat 9, what's really new is we've had to have a major overhaul of the TLS support. And that's because in order to support HTTP2, we have to support server name indication, and we have to support application layer protocol negotiation. And Tomcat 8 doesn't support either of those. Um, Tomcat 8 has a very simple model. You have one connector. It supports one virtual host with one certificate. That's it. That's all you can do with Tomcat 8. Tomcat 9, and this is available already, um, and this I would consider stable. You can have multiple virtual hosts, so we've got SNI support. That's available across all of the connectors. Not only that, we'll let you have multiple certificates for an individual host. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth do I want more than one certificate? The thing's only got one name, so surely I only need one certificate. Well, the reason you might need more than one is the ciphers you are, that are available for you to use depend on the type of certificate that you're using. So if you want, if you've, typically you'll have an RSA certificate, so you'll have the RSA ciphers. If you want some of the elliptic curve ciphers, you need an elliptic curve certificate. If you want to have a choice of either RSA or elliptic curve, you have to have both certificates available. And that, that feature's been in HTTPD for a while. It's been in OpenSSL for a while. It's now available in Tomcat as well. And basically, we, do, we, do, we treat it the same way we do the SNI trick. We parse the initial client, a handshake from the client. We look at what ciphers the client wants to use. We look at what ciphers the server wants to use. We work out what the match is. And then we work out, well, OK, you want to use an RSA-based cipher, so you need to give you the RSA certificate. If it's an EC-based cipher, we give you the EC certificate. If it's DSA, then we give you the DSA certificate. And that's pluggable and extensible. And if the, some new weird and wonderful crypto cryptography comes along in the future, and then there's some other base certificate, then we can support that as well very easily. Yes? What does the browser support for SNI look like? Fine. Yeah, bra bra as long as you're on something remotely recent, then you're fine. Um, really old versions of Java, the clients don't support SNI on the client side. I think Java, si Java client side SNI support that came in in Java 7. So you, know, you really shouldn't be using Java 6 these days. Um, if, I think if you're using IE6 on XP, then SNI isn't there. But again, you shouldn't be using IE6 and you shouldn't be using XP. Um, something that you might find really useful, um, I use it a lot, is a SSL test site called from SSL Labs. They provide a SSL test where you point it at your server. And not only do they test that you, yeah, your certificate's valid, you're, you're protected against all the various vulnerabilities. They give you a list of about 20 or 30 different clients, and they tell you how that client will connect to your server based on your server's configuration. And you can see very quickly, 
oh, yeah, I'm not actually supporting um, XP. Yeah, don't care. Oh, hang on, I'm not supporting any IE client. That might be a bit more of a problem. And it tells you what you need to do to adjust <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have views on IE as well, but you know, in certain corporate environments, you don't really have a choice. Um, but it, it's a very useful test site to tell you what's the, what it works with. It covers all of the major clients, all of the Android clients, the iOS clients, IE, all the major, Chrome, Firefox, all the major browsers. It's incredibly helpful to see how your server's configured. Um, I typically run the Tomcat default <coughs> settings through it every couple of months just to check we're not missing anything. Um, and I'm kind of aiming for, if I get a B plus or an A, I'm, I'm happy. If we get an F, I'm kind of worried and thinking, okay, what have we forgotten to filter out? Um, so it's really, really very useful site for seeing what the, um, how your TLS server is configured and what browsers you're going to support and what you're not, what certificates you've got, what you're not, what ciphers you're going to end up using. Yeah. Like a user uh, feature request. Mm -hmm. Um, I went through with that site and my Tomcat configuration was getting a C. And I had to like spend a lot of time Googling to figure out what are the good cipher suites, what are the bad cipher suites. I wish Which I Tomcat version were you using? Uh, seven. Seven what? Uh, the latest seven. The latest seven should get like more I than a C. Because there's a place where you say cipher suites and you specify them. You specify the order of them. I had mm. to Google to find out what collection of cipher suites SSL the, the Labs was going to? The default should give you an A or a B. If it doesn't, I've got some work to do. You shouldn't need to specify anything to get a reasonable score on that. Okay, I, I kept like removing stuff until it gave me an A. And yeah, like, well, okay. remove anything with RC4 in it and you're probably <laughs> fine. Okay. Um, the, the default should be better than a C. Um, if, it's, okay. if they're getting a C at the minute, I need to go and look and find out why. Um, I just, yeah. Not sure what's going on there. But what complicates it is the ciphers that are available, depend on which version of Java you're running on. I upgraded to Java 8. Uh, that, yeah, that'll help. <laughs> um, because, yeah, for Java, for Tomcat, if you're using a GSSE based connector in 7, it will use whatever the default ciphers are uh, presented by the JVM. So, if Oracle haven't updated it, or you're using an old version of the JVM, yeah, you might get a C. If you switch to Java 8, um, Java 8 has got a cool feature where it will allow you to specify your cipher suites using the OpenSSL cipher string. So you can just take exactly what you use in HTTPD, copy it across to Tomcat, and it'll just work. And we use that as the default, so we can, automa it, it, we can automatically filter out all, all the, the useless stuff that Java enables by default and actually get a better score. So eight will, should give you a much better score. Yeah, well, um, it was, now and then it had the perfect forward secrecy, which yeah. was available on 7. Yeah, 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 that, that's uh, ciphers that are available in Java 7 problem. Um, getting back to the, the new features, obviously going from a one connector, one virtual host, one certificate, to one connector can have multiple virtual hosts, each host can have multiple certificates. We've had a tweak the SSL configuration a little bit. So we've added a few more elements to server.xml, but we've also taken the opportunity to tidy things up a bit and get rid of the, some of the craziness where if you configured something with OpenSSL it was and JSSE, they had the same attribute names, they just had different cases. So we've, we've kind of made things common where we can. We've also maintained backwards compatibility. So if you, de if you deploy a, jar, a Tomcat 8, SSL configuration to Tomcat 9, it will just convert it to the new one and it'll still work. But obviously much better to use a new one so you can have mul multiple certificates. Uh, talk about all of that. Da -da 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 -da. Right, one of, one of the interesting things that's, that's um, we've added in Java 9, um, a few people have thought over the years, well, GSSE performance is hopeless, OpenSSL is really good, JSSE is a plug is intended to be pluggable. You can take JSSE providers from different vendors and plug them into the JVM. Wouldn't it be a really cool idea to have an OpenSSL based JSSE provider? That way we get all the benefits of OpenSSL, but we don't have to worry about interfacing with it because we can just use the standard Java APIs. Many have tried. As far as I know, all have failed stroke given up because it gets too difficult. 
um, or just too complicated or it takes too long. However, those very clever folks over at Netty came up with a cunning wheeze. And what they noticed was that when you're setting up your GSSE connection, there's a point, and it's the point where we do the SNI handshake, and we say, OK, we know which certificate we need, so we'll go and pick the right SSL context to pass to this connection. At that point, all you need is an SSL context implementation. And rather than passing one that the GSE, GSSE provider has generated for you, it's actually quite happy if you pass your own completely independent implementation. And if that completely independent implementation happens to delegate to OpenSSL, all of a sudden you have an op OpenSSL powered JSSE. And that's what the good folks at Netty did. And then we thought, oh, that's a really good idea. They did it by actually forking Tomcat's APR native connector. So we said, oh, that's really nice. Oh, and better still, it's Apache version licensed as well. Excellent. Um, but because at Apache, we don't like to take code, even if we can, unless people are happy for us to do so. We went, we asked the Netflix, you don't mind if we take that back into Tomcat, do you? Golly gee, um, we won't need to maintain our fork anymore. Yeah, that's fine. Crack on. So we've put that into Tomcat 9. Um, and what that's given us is an OpenSSL engine option now on the GSSE-based connectors, NIO and NIO2. And this, I think, is our answer for ALPN support on Java 8. Because OpenSSL, we've got ALPN support. What this lets us do is use the, all the standard GSSE APIs in Java 8, but then just plug in this provider to give us ALPN. And that, I think, is how we're going to do it. Um, I just need to test that it works. Um, I, if it doesn't, I suspect it'll just be a little bit of plumbing that's missing. But that's the master plan for how we actually square the circle in terms of trying to support uh, or trying to use a feature that doesn't exist on a platform we have to use. Um, other new features that we're thinking about for um, Tomcat 9, I would love to see HTTP upgrade support in AJP. Um, that, on the Java side, I'm happy doing that. The problem is my C code has to go with a health warning. I can't write C code that's anything more complicated than maybe adding two numbers together. Um, if it goes anywhere near memory allocation, you don't want to let me touch it. Um, I think I might have twisted Jonathan's arm earlier to help me with on the C side, so we might actually be able to get that into Tomcat 9. That would be great, because then that would let us do WebSocket proxying um, from the HTTPD reverse proxy, or any other reverse proxy, which would be really nice. Um, if anybody out there has got any other features that, oh, it'd be, I really wish Tomcat did X, or it'd be really cool if Tomcat did X, we are more than happy to see those suggestions. Um, if you want to provide the suggestion with a patch that actually implements the feature, that would be even better. So that's sort of where our plans are. Th th this next slide is rather more pie in the sky, me just sort of thinking where things might end up. Probably won't end up in Tomcat 9, might happen in Tomcat 10, maybe, possibly-ish kind of thing. So if this OpenSSL engine thing works with um, NIO and NIO2, why do we need the APR native connector? Because the only reason for using APR native is SSL performance. Everything else, the, the, the Java-based connectors are just as good. Hmm, does that mean we can get rid of APR native? Quite like that idea. Get rid of a third of the connector code, it simplifies things a bit. There are, there are some APR-specific hacks in the code we'd be able to get rid of. Mm, quite promising. Once you start down that road, you start thinking, well, NIO and NIO2 aren't that different. Um, the performance is pretty much identical. NIO is arguably more stable. NIO2 is arguably more suited to doing some of the more, some of the asynchronous non-blocking stuff that we're doing at the minute. Do we need both of them? Maybe not. Maybe I could get down to a single connector. Or even, I've now deleted two thirds of the connector code, even better. Um, maybe, possibly. Um, what I suspect will happen is, as has happened throughout Tomcat's life, there will be particular use cases that will be suited to one or other of the connectors, and for that reason, we'll retain them. I think there's a 50-50 chance that we'll get rid of APR native. 
that really depends on how performant this OpenSSL engine in JSSE is. If it's as fast as APR native, I think there's a really strong case to get rid of the APR native connector. If it isn't, then there's obviously a reason to keep APR native. In terms of NIO and NIO2, um, I think partly because there's, there's not yet a clear argument that one's better than the other. I don't think we'll arbitrarily just pick one. We'll just keep them both. Um, part of the refactoring that I'll talk about later means that actually maintaining two isn't as much work as it used to be. So um, without a strong argument for getting rid of both, we'll, we'll keep both and see if one does sort of emerge as the better one. And if one is head and shoulders above the other in all use possible use cases, then that might be a case for getting rid of the other one. But we're not there yet. Question? Um, how do you, as the maintainer, test performance? How do I, as the maintainer, test performance? I have a really simple performance test. I spin up Tomcat. I have a dead simple load test web application that I can do things that it'll do something as simple as just return a hello world. I can. Um, generate garbage, I can put objects in sessions, um, generally just configure it for, okay, do hello world, how many requests a second can I support? And as long as that number is something sensible, and I consider sensible on, you know, on this laptop in the 20 to 30,000 requests a second, then I'm happy. Um, we're, that means we're adding, what, 50 microseconds, not milliseconds, microseconds of overhead per request. That's way below anything I've ever seen any application do in terms of request time. So I'm happy that Tomcat's overhead is sufficiently down in the noise that all the performance problems are going to be application-based. Um, every performance tuning consultancy job I have ever done where I've gone in to do Tomcat tuning, it's taken about 30 seconds for it to turn into application tuning. Um, the last time I saw to a performance problem in Tomcat was actually when e eBay found a couple of problems. Um, and eBay is at the crazy end of JSP usage. Their idea of a typical JSP page is, well, yeah, one to 2,000 tags, maybe. And I think, what? what? OK, so you've got a couple of thousand custom tags. Yeah, that might be a little bit slower. Um, and when you get up to that sort of scale, there were some things in the JSP engine that weren't as efficient as they could be. Um, and eBay, eBay not only very kindly found the problems, they provided patches to fix them as well. Um, and that sort of was knocking 30, 40% off the request processing time, or at least that bit of the request processing time. I think overall it was knocking between 5 and 10% off their overall request time. So even then, Tomcat wasn't the bulk of the delay, but it was a measurable bit. So they had reasonable patches. Um, some of them we needed to tweak because they were, they were perfectly reasonable if you had that number of tags, but you incurred a performance penalty if you only had one or two. So we had to tweak the, the patch so it did the sensible thing um, for both ends of the spectrum, as it were. Um, and they, they were very happy with that. We were very happy to get the patches. You know, thank you very much. They're being a good open source citizen. But that was the last time I sort of saw a real performance problem with Tomcat that was sort of Tomcat bottleneck related. So with OpenSSL and the APR stuff, you just sort of like try both and see if they're both the same then? Um, we, we, we periodically test it and JSSE is always atrocious. Um, every single time we've looked at it. Um, I do believe they've made some performance changes in GSSE that I think will be in nine, might get back ported to eight, but even after that, it's still you know, orders of magnitude difference. Um, so, yeah, generally I, I kind of look at overhead, and when I'm doing that test, I also look at how much garbage is being generated. You know, is that a sensible amount? Can we clean that up? Can we make it more efficient? Um, the sorts of changes I make, generally they sort of shave one or two percent off the response time. And again, well, 50 microseconds, 49 microseconds. I'm quite pleased to shave a few percent off, but actually that's not going to make any real difference to any app out there. Nobody's going to be able to measure that. Um, you know, most apps have response, that I see certainly have response times up in the you know, hundreds of milliseconds into the seconds. Um, yeah, that's generally what, when I get asked to, please come along and press and enable the magic make Tomcat run faster button. Yeah, can I delete the app first? Oh, no, okay. Uh, and then, then it's get the profiler out. Help, help, basically, it's teach them how to use a profiler at that point. Identify the bottlenecks. Um, and typically what we find is 
you know, they're doing repetitive expensive calculations on every request that they should cache. Um, another one is lots of dynamic includes in JSPs. Stat inclu static includes are more efficient because you then do them once on compilation and then they're just available every time. So it's sort of providing them with those sorts of pointers. But Tomcat generally never really had a performance problem with it. Okay, so I did say we'd remove some features. Yes, question there. Do you pass judgment on NIO versus NIO2? Nope, don't care. Okay. Personally, I have no strong feelings one way or the other. Um, there are things I loathe equally about both of them. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're just different, they're different styles. I, f I personally find NIO slightly easier to get my head around. That's really because it came first and I've spent longer trying to get my head around it. There really is, to my mind at least, no distinctive benefit of one over the other. Um, that's just different ways of doing the same thing. And I think if you code to, to their APIs properly for both of them, you get similar results with both of them as well. Um, I haven't seen sort of noticeable performance difference one way or the other. Yeah, you, you, you use one, yeah, you, you have a benchmark that uses one badly and the other one well, then one of them's gonna show up a lot better. You actually write a benchmark where you use them both properly, makes a difference. It's certainly not in, in, the, in the, for the, for the level of overhead that they add at sort of the Tomcat IO, it's, yeah, again, all, the, all, of, all of the delays in the apps, not in the IO layer. So I mentioned that we re we'd remove some features in Tomcat 9. Um, the first feature to, um, we said goodbye to was the blocking IO connector. Um, all the specs were increasingly in introducing non-blocking. Um, there was servlet async, then there was the non-blocking IO. WebSocket lets you flip between blocking and non-blocking. And trying to make that work with the blocking IO connector was creating complexity. You don't get any scalability benefits. And what you do get is ample opportunity to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so we managed to work around all the places where we were Tomcat was shooting, you, shooting itself in the foot. And that was a little bit messy. But there was still ways that you as an application developer could use the API completely legitimately. But because it was using blocking IO underneath, you could still shoot yourself in the foot and end up with a deadlock. Um, so that's obviously not a nice place to be. Um, it, was, it got to the point where there really wasn't much point continuing to maintain it. Doing HTTP2 with this was going to be just unbelievably messy, so that got rid of it. Um, I always like deleting code. It's always, it's always a happy day when I can remove a few thousand lines of code. So saying goodbye to BIO, BIO I had a big grin on my face that day. Um, so this isn't something I decided to do on a whim. It's actually been, we discussed it on the mailing list back in the days of Tomcat 7. We could see the direction things were going in. And back then we said, OK, BIO at some point is going to need to be removed. So for Tomcat 8, we said we'll make NIO the default. That default remains in Tomcat 9. APR is still available. Um, and we've also introduced NIO 2 as well in Tomcat 8. So this was planned. We changed the defaults in 8, and we removed the feature in 9. Um, the next thing we got rid of was Comet. Um, for those of you that don't know, Comet was a proprietary interface for doing asynchronous I.O. It was around a long time before Socket, before WebSocket, and you know, in its day, it was a pretty good solution. The thing is, pretty much the second WebSocket became available, everybody switched to it. Um, we see very, very, very little Comet. Um, and I did get one bug report a couple of weeks ago where we'd fixed one thing and caused a regression if you were using Comet and you're running under a security manager. And we, we, we must have hit the one user that's actually using that configuration. Um, but we found, yeah, we fixed the bug. That's fine, not a problem. But yeah, pretty much everybody's moved to WebSocket. It, again, it was adding a whole pile of complexity to the connectors. Um, you know, lots of big, if using Comet, do this. Otherwise, do this instead. Um, so got rid of it. And again, that enabled us to get rid of a lot of complexity. The reason I wanted to get rid of that complexity was because HTTP2 was coming. Now, HTTP2 itself was going to add complexity. We've gone from one incoming connection having one request to one incoming connection having potentially hundreds of requests that need to be farmed out across individual processing threads and then have those responses multiplex back into a single connection. That in itself is complicated. And I really didn't want to build that complexity 
on top of what we already had for the connectors. Um, part of the problem was back in the Tomcat 4 day we had BIO and then for 5.5 BIO got copied and pasted to create and edited to create APR, then APR got copied and pasted and edited to create NIO, then NIO got copied and pasted and edited to create NIO2 and there was a lot of almost common code between them but not quite. Um, so I started trying to clean this up in Tomcat 7. I went a little bit further in Tomcat 8. Um, and by the time we got to Tomcat 9, it was right. There is no way I'm going anywhere near HTTP2 until I fix this properly. So we did a major cleanup on the connector side before we even looked at HTTP2. Um, so part of that was removing BIO and Comet. Another part of it was saying, right, anything that is NIO, NIO2 or APR native specific and relates to the connection as a whole, we're moving that into, into an endpoint class. And that will, again, that inher all the common stuff is co in a common base class, and the implementation specific stuff is in the, in the concrete implementations. Then we're going to take anything that's connection specific, and we're going to have connection specific implementation classes as well. Everything else is going to be common, and give or take a couple of exceptions because, so we can handle configuration differences. That's where we've ended up. Um, it used to be the case that we had separate implementations per connector, so NIO, NIO2, APR, and BIO, for HTTP, for AJP, and upgrade. Um, by doing the cleanup, we've reduced a whole part of duplication. I mean, upgrade went from 12 classes down to three. Um, I removed about 400 lines of code for upgrade. I removed about 2,500 lines of code for the HTTP 1.1 stuff, about 400 lines of code for AJP. So all in all, about 3,500 lines of code. Maybe a little bit more. If you include Comet and BIO as well, it's probably, probably more like 4,000, 4,500 lines. Out of a total of about 120,000, which you know, that's a few percent. That's, that's not an insignificant amount of code. Um, yeah, no, that 120,000 lines of code, that's all of Tomcat. Every single bit of Tomcat, 120,000 lines of code. Um, very, very small footprint, just as an aside. Um, the advantages we got from doing this cleanup was all of the little edge cases that had crept in, where different connectors behaved slightly differently in the same circumstances, that's all gone because there's now one implementation for all of them. So we get better stability, we get better, and the stability wasn't bad to start with, but we get, you know, it's now better, the reliability is better, the consistency is better. What it also means is I've been able to implement HTTP2 without writing a single line of code that was specific to NIO, NIO2, or APR native. I've just written HTTP2 and gone to the standard common APIs that they all share. Um, and that, in my book, is a big tick that we got those APIs right. So it means when the next WYSI protocol comes along that we want to implement, I'm pretty confident we're not going to have to write protocol specific, sorry, implementation specific code for it. So yeah, definitely heading in the right direction. Next one was WebSockets. When I wrote the WebSocket implementation for Java 8, I had this grand idea that let's write it on top of Servlet 3.1. That way, it can be portable, and you can take Tomcat's WebSocket implementation and use it in any other Servlet 3.1 compliant container. It was a lovely idea, and it worked up until the point where it didn't work anymore. And the problem was that WebSocket lets you flip between non-blocking and blocking I.O. as much as you like. You can, every time you send a message, you can choose whether or not to use blocking or non-blocking I.O. Thing is, if you're doing that with serv on top of Servlet 3.1, Servlet 3.1 has a very clear model. You start a request and a response. That's in, not, that's in standard traditional non-blocking mode. You can then move it to asynchronous. Um, you can then actually move it back from asynchronous if you like. But if you move from asynchronous to non-blocking, that's one way. Once you put that request and response in non-blocking mode, it must stay in non-blocking mode. And the problem is if you're doing WebSocket on top of that, you then have to start trying to simulate blocking if the user wants to do a blocking message. And you can't actually simulate blocking without deadlocks unless you sort of bend, twist, creatively interpret some of the rules in the servlet spec. And we could do that with Tomcat, but we knew the other containers weren't going to do it. So this idea of having a portable WebSock implementation was actually a non-starter. Um, so 
it is still based on the Servlet 1 API in Tomcat 8, but in Tomcat 9, no, no, not worth doing. We took all of that code out and we went directly to Tomcat's IO layer, where blocking or non-blocking is as simple as you do the right method with or without the boot. Well, there's a Boolean flag, true for, for non-blocking, false for non-blocking, you pick the one you want, and it's dead easy to switch between the two. So that fits very well with what you need with WebSocket. So the advantage you get there is the code's simpler, it's faster, it's cleaner, and um, it should mean that when we have to refactor it to do, if we get pluggable extensions in WebSocket 2.0, then the WebSocket code itself is a bit cleaner and should be easier to refactor to implement that. That's my hope anyway. Um, other things I want to do, um, I have an absolute passionate hatred of using system properties for configuration because they end up being system wide and they're not really system wide. Um, if you're embedding Tomcat in your application, if you want to embed two Tomcat instances in your application for whatever reason, and you want them to have different configuration settings that are controlled by system properties, you can't, because system properties are system wide. And there are a number of cases where we do configuration via system properties when they really should be per connector, per server, per host, per web application, per whatever the thing it is they're actually configuring. And to be honest, the reason they're system properties is the committer that implemented them was feeling lazy that day. They didn't want to go through and add the getters and setters and add the code to process the, um, the XML to set those getters and setters because that's rather more work than just doing system get property. Um, it's got to the point where these days I veto commits like that on the grounds that people are taking shortcuts. But there's a few that slipped in before I decided to do that to so want to go through and actually do all those properly. What we will do is we'll keep the system properties as a way of setting the default, but the actual value will be setting per will be settable per whatever the appropriate object is for setting that value. Uh, finally, uh, Tomcat 8 comes with two cookie processors, um, one based on RFC 2109 plus a whole bunch of configuration options to ignore the parts of the spec that the browser's never bothered to implement, and one based on RFC 625, which is that we give up, we're going to define the specification as whatever the browser say it is, um, cookie spec. With one small extension, we'll let you use UTF-8 va values in the, in the cookie values. Strictly, that's not allowed, but there are plenty of people out there at Google that are already doing it, um, so... It, it, it doesn't cause any security harm to do it that way, so we, we make that option available. And all we've done in Tomcat 9 is we've switched the default. So they're both available in 8, they're both available in 9. In 9, we've just switched over the default. In theory, you shouldn't really notice any difference. Um, if you do, you can always switch back if you need to, um, or look at why the cookie parsing is failing and, and figure out what, what the application is meant to be doing. Most cases of cookie problems tend to be applications bending to breaking point the rules on what can and can't be in a cookie value. Um, yeah, with the older specs, things like having equal signs in cookie values, yeah, that was a no-no, because -no, equals was the delimiter between the name and the value. Um, so putting base64 encoded values in cookie values tended to break things quickly. Um, and again, there's an option in Tomcat that says, yeah, okay, just... The f just treat the first equal sign as the delimiter between the name and value and every other equal sign as part of the value and hope that things are properly deli delimited later on. Um, so there are ways, ways around it. So um, that's what's new in Tomcat 9. If you are interested and you want to get involved in Tomcat, there are lots of different ways to get involved. Um, when I got my commit bit in Tomcat, I was probably in the bottom 1% of Java developers. I was hopeless. Um, I did some really, really stupid things, and it's all there in the archives for you to go and look at. You know, I got asked questions like, so why didn't you use a string builder here? Because uh, I didn't actually know that class existed. Um, yeah, that's how good my Java was. And hey, I got the commit bit. Um, so you don't have to be the world's greatest Java developer in order to get involved in Tomcat. We have people who are committers who have never written a line of Tomcat code in their lives and are never going to write another, a line of Tomcat code in their lives. They're a committer because they've been on the users list for ages. They really know Tomcat as a user very well and they live, give lots of really good advice to people who ask questions. So they got recognised for that. They're committers on the project, but purely because of their contributions to the users list. Um, so if you've got a question, yeah, please ask it on the users list. If you think you found a bug, 
Um, if you're not sure whether it's a bug or not, probably the best place to start is the users list. We're always happy to redirect you to Bugzilla. Um, if you think you might have a bug, Bugzilla is probably not the best place to ask because we'll just punt you straight to the users list and say the bug's invalid until you come back with a proper description of something that really looks like a Tomcat bug. So if, you ne if, you're all, if you're ever unsure about what to do, the users list is probably the best place to start. But if you've got a bug in a test case, yeah, please you know, enter it in Bugzilla, we'll take a look. As I said before, we always aim to fix the bugs before the next release. So if you're using Tomcat 8 and you report a bug, it'll be fixed with, and available in a release within a month. Um, if you've got a bug and you've got a patch for that bug, even better, we take patches, as, attach them to Bugzilla, GitHub pull requests, you know, scribble it on a bit of paper and send it to me via carrier pigeon. I'll take it any way you like. Patches are always very welcome. If you do want to follow along in development, then we do use SVN as our canonical repository, but we've also got mirrors on GitHub. Um, I actually tend to have an SVN checkout and a GitHub clone, and I switch between the two, um, depending on exactly what I want to do. Sometimes the SVN style of working is easier. Sometimes the Git style of working is better suited to what I want to do, so I just jump back and forth, and you, know, you can do that very easily. So you know, choose whichever one is, is your favorite, whatever works for you. Uh, all the development, all the discussions happen on the dev list. Um, if you've got dev-related questions, that's the place to ask them. Um, if, you see that, if you see something that's wrong with the wiki, or you've got an FAQ that needs added, then yeah, please do edit the wiki. You'll need to ask us to enable your account for editing first, but yeah, that's a quick email to the dev list. We'll get that done. You really don't need to be an expert, as, as you know, I, I can certainly attest to. I was definitely not an expert when I got involved in Tomcat. Um, I what still wasn't an expert by the time they gave me the commit bit. I probably wasn't you know, as good as I perhaps could, should have been when I was doing releases. Um, as long as you have something to contribute and you're adding to the community, then that contribution is very much always welcome. Um, obviously, documentation always needs patches. Um, the, the developers on Tomcat are no better than developers anywhere else, and documentation isn't necessarily our, our strong suit or our favorite thing to do. So if you spot a documentation problem, yeah, we accept patches for that just, just as much as we set patches for anything else. Um, I only overran a little bit. So at this point, we've taken a few questions as we've gone along. I'm happy to take any other questions people have got at this here. Yes. Uh, I've been a Tomcat user for quite a while, and I haven't done any development or mm -hmm. anything like that. But I'm curious as to how things like operating system integration fit into your development plan, stuff like startup scripts or compatibility with system D. Uh, I've noticed that on the list, it tends to be um, made the user's problem. On, on things like you know, starting Tomcat in different environments or working with JSBC and things like that. Um, so if it's an operating system we've got access to and we can test it, then great, then we'll, we'll test it, we'll fix it. Um, if your problem's on AS400, you really need to tell us what the prop, no, what we need. Like Red Hat Linux. Yeah, that, that, and that, I'm, that and all the, I'm, um, we should have access to those. Um, it does depend on exactly what it is the user's trying to do. Like, like right now, Tomcat doesn't come with a system D compatible nope. startup script. Right? it doesn't. So is that something that you're looking at maybe including? Like that's um, that I'm very helpful to me. I don't know, maybe we, we could, but I, what, what we find is that, that there are as many views as to what that script should look like as there are Linux distros. Right. And it's generally less hassle around to leave the Linux distro to write their own that suits them. Um, and I, I've got, yeah, if, if you look on people.apache.org, mark, uh, tilde mark t, I've got a, it's actually quite old init D script now that I use with Tomcat, right. um, that I actually stole from Philip Hannock, one of the other Tomcat committers. Um, so, and th th there's stuff around, but again, that was written for what I wanted to do. What, so it, it's difficult to come up with a one size fits all, which is the, which is the problem there. Right. Um, what we try and do is provide pointers to samples and to, to help sort of point people in the right direction or go and look at what the distro is doing. Um, could we do more? We could probably organize those examples better, provide, you know, provide a way, something in the documentation that say, yeah, here's a starting point or something. That would be, that would be awesome. Um, if, if you've got one that you've already written that you'd like to contribute, then patches are always welcome. Okay. Mark. Yes. Um, 
So total committers is about 20. Um, in terms of regularly active doing stuff, um, it's me, Constantine, Violetta, Raina, the guy in Japan whose name I can't pronounce, um, possibly a couple of others on and off. So I'd say there's, there's sort of you know, eight to ten active committers. Um, I'm probably the one who gets most of their work time available to work on Tomcat. Um, but certainly, you know, Tomcat doesn't grind to a halt if I disappear. And you're the only one in the Trump area? I'm the only one? In the Trump area? Uh, I'm, not in, I'm in the UK. Oh, <laughs> um, so where are they based? I'm in the UK. Yeah, I'm here on a flying visit. Um, there, Philip Hannick is in Colorado, um, near Denver, I think. Um, Constantine is somewhere around St. Petersburg. Rainer is in Germany, Remy is in France, Jean Frederick is in Switzerland, Meladen's in Switzerland, the J Japanese guy's in Japan, um, Violetta's in Germany. So we're, we're, we're dotted around the place. Um, probably a slight concentration in Europe, maybe. Actually, no, uh, Chris Schultz, he's in Washington, DC. So it's, it's pr not too, I don't think we've got anybody in Australia, but. Otherwise, we're, we're pretty much spread around the various continents. Um, so if you ask, you know, chance if, you've, if you've got an urgent question, you ask it on the user list, there's probably one of the committers that are awake somewhere. Um, and then, you've, of course, you've got the committers that do the, that, that just don't do development but answer stuff on the user's list. So uh, Andre, I think, is somewhere in Europe, not sure where. Um, Chuck is somewhere in the middle of the continental United States, don't know exactly where. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's, there's a reasonable spread all over. It, I don't think, I'm not aware of any Tomcat committers that are actually based in Canada. I could be wrong, but I don't know any off the top of my head. Next question. Anybody want to wave their hands in the air? Yes. Um, so I saw some big uh, uh, you know, benchmark Mm -hmm. kind of a big mix. Yep. And for the like the Java ones, the ones that were highest were I guess the resin ones, the mm -hmm. ones, they didn't know what the versions were. And then so I kind of tried to look into that and I think it's because resin has some like uh, C coded non blocking IO stuff that they bundled in. And I was wondering how like the newer version of Tomcat how it compares with some of that. Because I know that we use like a lot of times like Nginx as a reverse proxy for mm -hmm. stuff. It it I mean the thing with benchmarks is you can normally pretty much write them to prove anything you like. Um, I think I know the one you're talking about, but the Spring folks um, really didn't like the way the, the Spring came across in that benchmark. It, it didn't look very good at all. Um, and I think that, that was a consequence of if you're writing a Hello World app, a full Spring app, a full, full Spring MVC app is perhaps a little bit of overkill just to write Hello World. You know, it, it's horses for courses. Um, Tomcat, I believe, wasn't tested with the API native connector. It was probably tested with BIO, which means send file wouldn't have been available. Um, and Java can hold its own um, on, a, on load testing. And Philip Hannick, one of my colleagues, a while back, did some testing with Tomcat's NIO connector. And he basically saturated a couple of gigabit network connections on a Solaris box way before Tomcat ran out of headroom. It was basically, he ran out of network before he ran out of anything else. Um, so, I think you, you can, I, I, I would be amazed if on a like-for-like -like comparison, actually if, if Tomcat was that different to any other application server, um, I would expect it to be on a par with all of them. Um, and interestingly, I was doing, doing a consultancy job a, a little while back for a newspaper company in the UK. Um, they were migrating off web, well, sphere, logic, can't remember which one, onto TC Server. Um, and they basically took the exact same app, deployed it on TC Server, and found it was 50% faster. And I have absolutely no idea why. 
because it really should have been doing pretty much exactly the same thing in pretty much exactly the same way. And, you know, I, I could kind of understand about five, ten percent one way or the other, but fifty percent just that there was. I wasn't convinced that was all, you know, all TC servers to TC servers credit. Part of me wonders whether something wasn't quite configured right on 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 the web serial web logic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, of, the number of knobs that you could turn and completely fuck yourself over with. <laughs> yeah. Right? And the thing is, is the default settings don't actually make sense for most, most applications, at least whatever, eight years ago when I was dealing with it. So I'm, yeah. not, I'm actually not that surprised yeah, I just because the open source projects tend to have better defaults. Yeah, I, I, I do wonder if it was more of a configuration issue than anything else. And certainly what was the case. Um, when, when we were doing this migration, they were they, they did their own um, couple of national newspapers and a whole bunch of regional ones. The whole thing was running on three fairly beefy Solaris boxes, and the IT manager had the purchase order for the fourth one on his desk, ready to sign because they were running out of capacity. Switched it over to TC Server. They could switch one of them off. Tore up the purchase order. Switched the third one off, and it was it was the standby in case they needed it. And certainly, the the fact you did get a lot of benefit from the smaller footprint. Um, they had. Um, much more memory capacity, much more CPU capacity. That really did help. Um, and that I am prepared to say, yeah, that was down to smaller footprint, Tomcat stroke TC server. But yeah, the performance, I suspect, is more down to how the thing's tuned and how it's configured. Well, but that's the, that's the thing. Like, the times I've used Tomcat in the past, the defaults tend to be same. Yeah, yeah like I mean, there's, there's, there's not really that much you can tweak in Tomcat. I mean, exactly. Really, it comes down to, well, it's how many, how many concurrent threads do you allow? Well, I mean, that, that's really, you know, Tomcat will, take as, will let you use as many as you like. It's really how many resources does your application use per current, concurrent request? And that's the determining factor for how many threads you can have. The app's memory usage will, will dominate, and Tomcat will run ha quite happily in 20 meg. Um, you know, what the app uses is going to be, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you, you, I do occasionally see people on the users say, oh, yeah, we want to tune the accept count on the connector. I'm thinking, what, really? You, you've genuinely got to the point where the biggest factor in your application's performance is the accept. I, frankly, I never believe. Um, I pr can pretty much guarantee that they're, they're clutching at straws trying to avoid anything other than tuning their application, which is what they really need to do. I say every Tomcat tuning job I've ever done has taken less than a minute to turn into application tuning. Um, and if you do find yourself in that boat, personally, and I will say they, they give me a free copy, so I am slightly biased, but buy a copy of your kit, turn on the CPU profiling, see where the box is and fix them. By far the quickest way to get performance benefit to your application. Get a decent profiler. It doesn't have to be your kit. Any one, you know, there are lots out there. Pick one that works for you. Profile the app. Deal with the bottlenecks. Um, if you get to a p the point where the profiler is adding so much overhead, it's hiding where the true bottlenecks are, that's probably the point where you can pretty much say, yeah, I'm done. Um, and that's where, we, if I run a profiler on Tomcat, that's where I am. Um, I can't actually figure out where the real bottlenecks are because the profiler adds more overhead than, that, than Tomcat's generating. Um, and that's kind of why I'm, yeah, I'm, I kind of consider that, yeah, I'm done here, I don't need to do any more. Yes? Quick question about performance. Mm -hmm. So typically, with um, Nginx or Apache from Tomcat, for PSSS, we don't get any questions or files from Nginx or Apache, we just don't touch any application. Mm -hmm. Um, <sighs> I'll caveat a bit. You may want to repeat the question. For yeah, the yeah. Well. So the, the, the question is, um, is there, effectively, is there benefit to running a reverse proxy in front of Tomcat? What's the performance benefit? Is it, is it positive? Is it negative? It varies a little bit from circumstance to circumstance. But these days, if you're using one of the non-blocking connectors on Tomcat, and if you're using, if you're terminating SSL, if you're using APR native, I would say that dropping the reverse proxy will give you, if it's there purely for performance reasons, I would drop it and I'd go directly to Tomcat. That said, 
there are usually lots of other good reasons for having a reverse proxy in front of Tomcat. It might be doing a bit of load balancing. It might be reverse proxying across multiple different services that are hosted on different technologies. Some are running Tomcat, you know, some are running PHP, some are doing something else. Um, some, you, you know, you've, you've, got a, you've got an app that basically says, yeah, this has got to run in its, its own instance and don't run it on anything else, Jira. Um, and if you, if you want to put that in the mix, then you need a reverse proxy so you can, you can have Jira available at the URL you want it available at. So for pure performance reasons, I would say these days it sh you shouldn't notice much of a difference. And the Tomcat connectors, they'll use send file, it'll use OpenSSL. Um, one of the uh, Tomcat committers periodically does a performance comparison and presents it at ApacheCon. And the results from that are normally the Tomcat on its own is slightly better. And it really comes down to you're adding an extra hop, you're adding more processing. And fundamentally, they should be, it's not actually adding very much. If Tomcat is working as efficiently as it should, um, then you're good to go. I mean, you, you then get into, if you still see a performance difference, you have to say, well, are you comparing like for like? What's the static resource cache? In, for, you know, in memory caching for static resources configured on HTTPD, have you got a similar configuration on Tomcat? Well, if not, you're not comparing like for like. Um, you, you enable the static resource cache on Tomcat, you know, give it a few hundred meg to play with, and it flies for static resource. It's, it's serving the stuff straight out of memory. It's incredibly quick. But then again, so is HTTPD if you do the same. You know, it, it's, you've got to compare like for like, and if you compare like for like, the performances are near as makes the difference the same with Tomcat having a slight edge because you don't have the overhead of the extra hops to do. Any other questions? Okay, well, I haven't eaten any dinner yet, so I'm planning on having food and a beer, so I'll be here for a little bit while. If there's anything else you want to ask me about, please feel free. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening to me witter on for the last hour and a half plus. Thank you.